My guest today is Paula Bishop. Paula is a CPA whose consulting practice focuses on helping families develop strategies to pay for their kids' college educations. She holds a finance degree from the Wharton School and an MBA from Berkeley and is a board member of the National College Advocacy Group, an organization that provides education and resources for college planning professionals, students, and families. Paula, thanks so much for joining us today to share insights and strategies about the complex and high-stakes college financial aid process. Thank you for having me. I'd love to start out first just by understanding a little bit more about your background. Your background combines tax, accounting, college financial aid expertise, which is you know cross-disciplinary, and certainly not everybody in your field has a varied background like that. How did you get into becoming an expert on college financial aid? Okay. When you think of – I'm a CPA. When you think of a CPA that works for themselves, what do you think they do? What do they do most of the time? Prepare tax returns. Right. Do you wake up every day saying, oh, wow, I can't wait to jump into a juicy tax return? <laughs> Neither have I. Never. And so we have to take continuing education. And at the CPA Society in December, when we have – that's our year end, you know, depending on your cycle, there was a class called Financial Aid for College, the Best Kept Secret in America. And being a woman, of course, we like secrets. And I said, well, I'll take this. And it's eight hours. How, do, how c could there be eight hours of information about college and how to get money from colleges? So I'm, I sat in the front row because that was the only one left. And um, I went, wow, people don't know how this works. And all the forms relate back to a tax return. So as much as I dislike tax returns, I still probably prepare about 125 tax returns a year because – um, you know, you need it for the, the forms. And pe people aren't born knowing what is your untaxed income, what is your tax deferred income, that kind of stuff. So being a CPA, I can help review them. I can pretty much tell what the schools think that they can afford. So it works out very well. So I'm not going to get rid of – even today I have a client this afternoon. He hasn't done his 18 yet because he was out of the country. And TurboTax lost his file because I think at some point they stopped doing 18's return. So I said, I can whip out one for you. So he was happy. So I can do it for him. So that's how I got there. Got it. Cool. Thank you so much. So – uh, when you when we think about financial aid for college, it can certainly be overwhelming for families. There's like all these different things to know about. There's need-based aid, merit aid. There's aid from all different types of sources, from governments, from colleges themselves, from foundations and corporations. There's multiple forms asking a whole host of questions about your finances that you have to fill out to qualify for most of the stuff. So to help just orient listeners before we dive into the meat of it, what's the sort of one minute how it works summary for how the college financial aid process works? Okay. The people that contact me are the ones that need money, right? The really rich people are actually, they get it easy. They just write a check, right? That's easy, you know, and if depending on how, how rich you are, it doesn't even bother them. So, you know, I never meet those people. But you first have to realize 98% of money from uh, that the student's going to receive for college comes from the colleges itself. So you need to pick your college well, wisely. Only 2% of the money comes from all these little scholarships. And the reason why is that Senior year, when they might be looking for those scholarships, kids are doing their AP tests, they're doing their applications, their outside activities and things. And at midnight, when their parents say, hey, you need to start looking for scholarships if you want to go to that you know, school that costs $75,000, they go, are you crazy? Um, you know, so I actually tell the parents they could look for them you know, put in the, their names and all the demographics and stuff and then try to find ones that have minimal work involved. But every year, very and tell me when you get them, very few tell me that they ever want them because people are darn right lazy. They don't want it. But if a school can give you, say, $25,000 a year, that's a lot of little scholarships you don't have to give. So first, you have to figure out um, are you on the need base? There's two types, of, as you mentioned, two types of aid, need based based on your income and your assets and then merit money just based on how smart you are. And there's about 60 colleges in the United States that only give out need based aid. I wrote an article for Money Magazine at the time. Now it's um, Kiplinger. It was called, My Kid is So Smart, Why Didn't We Get Any Money? Well, I know right away they apply to Harvard and Colgate and all those schools that just do not 
give out because they, they have so many smart kids they don't have to so if you eliminate those then the rest of the 3,000 or so schools can give out merit money so the first thing you have to do is look at your income and assets and figure out whether you qualify for aid or not what side of the fence are you on the need based or not and if you're on in so about two hundred and sixty thousand dollars of of adjusted gross adding back your 401k contributions you're out of the the range for need based aid, and unless you want to pay, say Cornell seventy eight thousand next year, this is the hardest part. Don't let your kid apply because what if he gets in? Then he's got to go. But Stanford, I always let them apply because very few get in. Like it's like a if you're unconnected, maybe two percent get in, and you know maybe relatives will pool the money to get to allow you to go to Stanford so they can have it on their bumper sticker. So you have to figure out whether a need based candidate or not, and if you're not. Uh, then you have to look for merit. And usually people in the higher wealth areas have pretty smart kids for some reason because they can go to AP classes, they can have tutors, they can go to have tutoring for your SATs, ACTs, and all of that. So, you know, some schools give 2.8 kids a $5,000 scholarship. So, and then the bottom line is if you have no money, you might have to go to the state school. And every state has some good state schools. You can't say they're all lousy. And the limit on that might be 25. And if you're very poor, they will give you a full ride to go to the state school. The state schools don't say, oh, you're 2.5. If you get in, you're treated the same as somebody at 3.8. So if the step one is you have to figure out and you have this question later, is what is your expected family contribution? Is it okay if we address that right now? Um, uh, sure, go ahead. We can give that a okay. teaser. All right. There's a, there's a calculator on College Board, and it's just called EFC Calculator. You just Google EFC Calculator. It's usually the first one that comes up. It's the easiest on the whole you know, on the internet for figuring out what it is, is your expected family contribution, what the system thinks you can pay for college and what they think is not what you think. So you put in your income, your assets, press the enter key, sit down and at, on this, you know, take a deep breath. And on the screen, it tells you that number and it's always higher than what you think. And if the number is 90 grand, that means you don't qualify for aid because no school is 90 yet. But if it's 26, it means you probably don't get any money from your state school, but a lot of the private schools should give you some need-based aid. So Got it. that's how that thing works. Can you walk us through high level what a typical college financial aid timeline looks like? So if I'm a college-bound or if I, if I have a college-bound student, what is the life cycle? Like specifically, what actions will this student be doing each month from the time they start their uh, their aid packet, uh, their, their time, from the time they start their applications uh, for financial aid to the time their package is finalized? Um, and also like when, when does the cycle begin during the year and when does it end? And what are sort of some of the key dates and deadlines that folks should be aware of? Well, to me, financial aid, Get, applying for it, you know, evaluating it, all that is really the parent's responsibility. What kid that's 17 or 18 do you know knows what adjusted gross income is? They don't even know what a 1040 is because I would ask them, did your parents file 1040A, EZ, or the 1040? I don't know. You know, they do pay taxes, you know, they think Social Security is income tax. So I don't want a, a a student anywhere near the FAFSA form, they can put in their – the FAFSA people think kids are you know, very responsible. So they have a phone app now where they can put in their part of what schools that they're applying to, what year they're applying to. Like if you're a first-year uh, freshman or something, they still mess it up. So they'll pick – like University of Texas has different campuses, right? Dallas, Austin – They'll pick the wrong campus, so then their their results go to the wrong campus. So I want the parents to do it because the parents are a little smarter, a little smarter. So kids in sophomore freshman sophomore year, you really don't have to do anything. You just because you don't even know their GPA, SAT scores, what they want to study. So just let them do well in school. That's the the most priority, the biggest priority. Some parents come to me sophomore year. 
and those are the ones that are a little bit with it. They, they worried about it because they know schools cost a lot of money and they go to a high school where everybody's competitive and all looking at the big expensive schools. And then junior year is when they get really serious. So I like seeing kids in junior year or their parents uh, so that they have some a PSAT or something because some schools give a, a – A's out like candy, right? You probably know that. And then others, it's, it's tough to get an A. And so most schools look at both of the a standardized tests plus their GPA to figure out merit money. And at that point, too, usually the kid has – I shouldn't say kid. It's a student. He has developed – alike for different types of schools he might want to go to. What if he's a 4.0 and he thinks he's brilliant, then I'm sure all the Ivies are on there. But to me, Ivies are all one school because they all give out aid the same way. And you say, well, if you don't get into an Ivy, what's the next level of school? So I'll come up with some. What do you want to study? So I like working with about 10 schools. And then what I do is take their tax return at that point, run it through the calculators to tell them what you know, the EFC is, and then every school has a calculator on their own website called a net price calculator. Have you heard of that? No. Okay. And the government and the, the Department of Ed and the colleges agreed that they would put a calculator on their website that mimics how they give out aid for that specific school. So once you know your EFC, Say it's 90, but then you use a calculator for, say, I don't know, Berkeley or something, and you're getting a full ride, you know it's wrong because this calculator just it, it reflects how Berkeley gives out aid. It asks, are you a, a, a resident of the state? What's your parents' adjusted gross income? What are their wages? What are your taxes? How many in the family? What are your assets? Press the enter key in. So I'd say they're about 80% accurate. It depends on the school, on what they're, you know. So I run it for each of the schools. And since I've seen so many awards over the years that I can tell whether it's accurate or not. And then I'll take that and sit with the parents or, you know, 90% of my clients are all over the country. And then we'll go over how they calculated it. And then we decide what schools are keepers and what they aren't what aren't keepers. And and a student can't tell me that this is their dream school. It's the only school that's good for them. How do they know? They could get there and hate their roommate, hate the classes, hate their professors. So there's plenty of schools that they would do well in. So I, I feel that the, the student and the parents have to be realistic about what they can afford because no rich relative, many of them don't have rich relatives in the background that can bail them out. Okay, so this is all in junior year. So then what happens sort of on a month to month, month basis? Well, usually they – before Christmas, they look at it because the guidance counselors at school are talking about – SAT timing and if you should take a review class and what kind of – they give generalities about college. And so um, – Is this in the around, junior or senior year? Junior year. Okay. Yeah. Usually maybe the second half of junior year they do that because the seniors are already done, right? And and they give it as a class. They don't have like two students, you know. But – a student doesn't realize this. The guidance counselors are there for them. They can make appointments with them. You're not always called to the guidance counselor because you did something bad, right? So it's a free resource. They should go to see them. To, they know their grades and all of that from freshman year. You know, around here, I'm in Seattle. It's, you know, many, many students use private counselors. We probably have 70 of them in the Seattle area, and they're all busy. They do reviews of your essays. They help you find the perfect college. But only two of us in the area know the money part. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to look at tax returns. But to me, if you don't address the financial part of college, it's not a perfect fit because you shouldn't. the parents shouldn't go bankrupt. Like You deal with a lot of financial issues, and you shouldn't bankrupt the family just so that kid can have a – a nice bumper sticker on the right. car, and a lot of grad schools are, are where their final degree will come up, come out of. So junior year is when they're starting to get serious because senior year, from the get go, it's you know a race to the finish. Every kid, it seems to me, are convinced you have to apply early decision, 
And early decision deadlines are, they start October 5th, maybe October 30th, November 1, November 15th, because you get an answer before Christmas. And the FAFSA and the profile, well, those two financial aid forms, they're available October 1. So we can, I think that's one of your questions. We can talk about, you know, do you have a question about the the FAFSA and the profile, I would assume? Yeah, so uh, I guess, so in uh, the FAFSA and the the um, college scholarship service profile forms, they come up right at the beginning of the senior year. Is that correct? Right. Uh, October 1, they both come online. Got it. So now, during during junior year, it sounds like you you're essentially already, but you're, it sounds, sounds like you're essentially already pre-filling them so that when the forms open up that you can just like transfer the data over. Is that, am I? No, because interpret- junior, um, junior year is still open with regards to the tax return, I think. So you don't have the final numbers. So that's why you should go to the EFC calculator just using estimates on what what the system thinks you can afford. I want junior year for you to explore what colleges to put on those sample tens because right away senior year, you need to know what those ten are because you're going to apply early decision and you have to sort them out right away. Got it. Right? And you need some time to visit them. So that's why I like them to start – in junior year, so you can take Christmas break, maybe, <coughs> and spring break, and sometimes there's two breaks to go visit colleges that you might want on your list. Got it. That's okay. the last time because it's when kids are in school, and in the summer, it's an empty campus, so it's just other mm-hmm. potential students walking around campus, so you don't really see what the students look like. I see. Okay, so before we jump into the the meat of like what the forms are and exactly what's included, uh, just walk us through the rest of the schedule. So right when senior year opens, you're filling out the forms, you're sending in your early action or early decision applications, and then kind of what's a play-by-play throughout the fall, winter, and spring? Okay, so you, you start filling out the forms in October, right? When do you start school? In September. So pretty much right away, they have FAFSA night at school, and the guidance counselors, some of them, you call it the college scholarship service. Everyone calls it the CSS profile form. So you need to go to, say you're applying to Claremont McKenna in California. They require the CSS profile form plus the FAFSA. Every school file requires the FAFSA because it gives away government money first. So you, every school would rather give away somebody else's money before their own. But you go to their financial aid page of their website how to apply, and it will tell you the FAFSA and the due date for early decision, regular decision, all of that, and the CSS profile. So many parents I'm meeting because I review a lot of these forms. That I say, did you do the profile form? What's that? Well, imagine if I didn't you know, re- have a review set up with them, and then they don't file it, right? Past the deadline, they might not get any aid. NYU would probably not give them any aid because – they passed the deadline, and they thought they were playing the game of, if I'm a full pay, maybe I'll get in. And sometimes schools, if you don't apply year one, they don't let you apply year two. You have to wait till year three. So that's an expensive mistake doing that. Sure. So parents aren't born, though, knowing to check what forms are are required because most – they have a FAFSA night. And the FAFSA so, night goes over the FAFSA, not the profile form. So are you saying that the CSS profile form, you have to fill it out to even be considered for admission? No, no, no. Oh. You, you never have to apply for aid for admissions. Okay. But if you want money from the school or be considered for money, you have to fill it out okay. by their deadline. Got, what, uh, what was the uh, – sorry, I didn't catch the link then. A moment ago you said – a lot of schools don't let you apply in the second year. You have to wait to the third year, but they don't know. Well, so they if a parent forgets, right, and they're applying early decision, and then in they get no aid, right, and they call the school and they say, "Well, you didn't fill out the profile form." Oh, what's the profile form? Oh, I I'm see. sure the parents do that. Gotcha. They, then they try to fill it out in January. Depends on the school. They might say, "No, we don't accept any more for this year for early decision," and so and you get in, so now you're a full pay. I see. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, uh, again, just to clarify the rest of the, you know, what what parents should expect throughout the rest of the senior year. What happens again in the winter, spring, uh, you know, after you submit your okay. applications? Let's let's assume that the child applied early decision or early action because this year I haven't met anyone that ha- 
I have no scheduled reviews after January 1 because all parents that I'm working with, it might be 100 or more, had their child applied early action, early decision, whatever. And so they fill it out in October, never fill it out on October 1 when it first comes out. Do you know why? No. It's a government form. Do you want to fill out a government form, a new one? It's a new one, a new version on October 1? No, it's not going to work. They're going to crash the system or something. There's always a problem. So I, I tell parents to have Halloween as their deadline, October 31st. They're still in the first wave of FAFSAs coming in. So you fill out the FAFSA, and um, you know there's a process for that. It's not that bad. And then you you make sure that your whole list, you should check to see every website to see what the due dates are and when and if they need a CSS profile. That's a parent's obligation. I wouldn't leave that up to the child at all because the kid is not going to pay for his own money, school, right? It's usually the parents. So the parents have to be aware of that. Gotcha. Oh, so, so then what happens in the winter, in the spring? Okay. And so if they got in early were accepted early decision by christmas time they have an eight award plus their acceptance so a small number of kids are you know are super happy <laughs> before and then there's another when early does, when does that happen yeah before christmas so I that see. you can have a good christmas because if you don't if you didn't get in now you're spending all christmas break writing essays for your next set of colleges where you didn't get in. So that's a lousy Christmas too or holiday, whatever. And so the next set come after January 1, maybe by January 15th, January 3rd, those are early action. And then regular decision usually is January 31st or the 15th or something like that. And all of their forms for financial aid are due probably at the latest, the, the good school, well, the higher selective schools by February 15th. Okay. If it's a school like a community college or something, you just apply when you want to. It's it. not really a big deal. So just to summarize, so if I'm understanding correctly, you're filling out FAFSA before Halloween, and then you're sort of tiering. In the or, profile if you need it by Halloween, both of them. For but for the just the first set of reach schools or for all the sets of reach, you know, backup Oops. one, backup two? Well, on the FAPSA, you're allowed to put 10 schools at once. And since you're already doing it, might as well put all your schools in there. Right. Because if they get it and you haven't submitted your application yet, they hold on to it until maybe the end of the summer or something waiting for the whole package to come in because your package in admissions, it's your test scores, it's your grades, it's your recommendations, your application, the essays. So it takes a while for that package to get together so that they admit or deny you, and then it goes over to financial aid. That makes sense for FAFSA, but what about the CSS profile? Are you advising parents to fill that out even before, say, Same time. I'd like to review both of them at the same time because – this is how I look at both forms. FAFSA goes with a glass of white wine. Profile goes with the whole bottle. That's the difference. You know, one's here, one's there. They go, oh, FAFSA was a piece of cake, right? Because they'll say, what are your assets? And no, very few of them look at the help screen to find out what your assets are. But assets, and then they'll say, what are your, well, what's your cash and savings and what are your investments? People don't know that stocks, money market, 529s are assets, so they screw up there. So when we get to the profile and the profile wants it on separate lines, then you know we have to go back and correct the FAFSA. So I always start a review with the profile form. Got it. So you're, so you're actually having parents fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile forms for – and I know we're going to jump into details on, on those later, but uh, – Basically, those are all getting filled out before Halloween, and then the actual applications themselves will go in three, you know, roughly three waves, one for early decision, next for early action, and then finally for regular decision. Is that correct? Yeah. Since you're already applying probably to one of the earlies, might as well throw all the schools in so that the data is the same for all the schools. Got it. Okay, cool. So, all right. So, let's jump into FAFSA now. So, uh, I think most folks have at least heard, of, heard it. of it. Yeah. Um, what is uh, kind of what's the the, the quick sentence uh, summary of what its purpose is, and does it need to be filled out every year? Well, FAPS is just a free application for federal student aid, and 
the good news is the word free. So the, the federal government is actually judged on how many high school students fill it out because they don't want the FAFSA to be a barrier to, to getting aid. And really, it's government money that's given out. But the free money is only Pell Grants and maybe a small supplemental grant, which at the most is like $2,000. Pell Grant goes up to six, but a normal state school costs at least $28,000. So if you get six from Pell, you get two from the other one, that's eight. They give out student loans as well, so $5,500 for a freshman. So that still only adds up to eleven or $12,000. But that's when it's good to be a state resident because most states have a grant just for their residents. California has the Cal grant. Here we have a state grant in Washington, which just goes up to 12,000. And that's how they fill all the need for a kid whose parents make like 50 grand. So if you make over, well, Cal grant goes up to 105 or something for a family of five and 95 for a family of four that they can get the, you know, $12,000 pelt. Uh, state grant. And so it gives out government money, whether it's state money or federal money. And then some of the non-selective private schools, let's say a Loyola Marymount, believe it or not, it's uh, they probably will go profile soon, but they're, they just, I call it a FAFSA school. Loyola Marymount is in uh, Southern California. They just use the FAFSA, so they can give out their own endowment funds to supplement whatever the federal government doesn't give it, give to the, the student because they cost probably $65,000, right? So there's a big delta between the state and federal giving them 20-something and 65. Are students so, filling out the FAFSA just one time for all four years, or they need to fill no, it out every year? No. Um, if you're going to school in 2020 – they're looking two years behind on the base year tax return. So they're looking at 18 because 18 should be a filed tax return by now. And so every year you have to fill out the FAFSA because it's based on then the 19 year and the 20 year when you're junior and 21 when you're a senior because you could win the lottery, right? And all of a sudden become rich. Or if you're a real estate agent, you know, sell two more houses in California, you know, you could almost retire with the commission on it. Got so, it. so you have to fill it out every year. Every Even the profile, you have to fill it out every year. I see. So both forms uh, you're filling out every year. Okay, cool. What assets and income are uh, required to be reported on FAFSA versus uh, can be excluded? Okay. For your income, they start with your 1040 tax return, adjusted gross income, because that's just a, a line that they can match to a tax return. Then they add back untaxed income. And untaxed income, parents say, well, where is that on my tax return? What are the words? Untaxed. It means it's not on your tax return. So it's your contributions to your 401k. So if you made 100, you put 20 in your 401k, your wages is only 80, so they want you to add back that 20. And that's a hidden ding to these families because they don't realize you have to add it back. Sure. And they most um, schools want to see your a W-2 so that they can tell from your W-2 you put 20 into your um, your into your retirement account. And they also, if you're receiving um, child support, they call that untaxed income. Those are the two major ones. Got it. And so that's all your income. And then for assets, it's they want cash, money, um, savings in one box, and then they want investments in the other. So it's stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Uh, on the FAFSA form, it's also equity in any rental properties or a second home you have. And sometimes that knocks you out of financial aid because in California – House prices are so high, and maybe if you've lived or had a rental property for a long time, you have a six hundred thousand dollar asset with no mortgage. So, the the run rate on assets is five percent. So five percent of that six hundred is thirty grand. They want you to pay every year from that asset. I see. And what is excluded? The for the FAPSA form, qualified annuities, which are retirement and also unqualified annuities are excluded in your 401k, any type of retirement product. I see. So that would include your 401k, any IRAs, yep. 403b, uh, Roth accounts. Those are all excluded, right? Right. What about and like HSAs? And, yeah. They don't care about HSAs. For, it's see. excluded for FAFSA purposes because there's no line on the FAFSA that asks for HSA. And, and also if you have a small business 
with under because there's a line what is the net worth of your business and people don't read the help screen because if your business is under 100 employees and that's most, most of, of them, them right yeah. you know what is the net worth of it people I'll see 75 and then I'll ask them what kind of business do you have oh I have a restaurant well you don't have 100 employees you know they're looking for a big manufacturing business sure. but the profile form asks for sorry just your to be business. sorry just to be clear that so yeah. fafsa uh, mm -hmm. you, you do not have to. You do not have to include small business equity, like your ownership stake, if it's under 100 employees. Right. Got right. it. What about primary residence? And your home, your primary residence is also yeah, is an is exempt asset that the federal government decided you shouldn't have to mortgage your home to go to college. I see. So basically, but, the for at least for FAFSA purposes, what you're including are your wage income uh, or your self-employment income. It sounds like and any taxable accounts, not retirement accounts, and any rental properties, but not your primary residence. Yeah. Is that correct? But if you have income generated from the rentals, that'd be on your tax return, part of adjusted gross income. Sure. If you have stocks, bonds, mutual funds, they generate income. And sometimes if you put nothing in your investment field and you got $8,000 in dividends, they'll say, wait a second, the only way to get dividends is through investments. So they, they know that you must have messed up and not included your... And you can always play dumb that you didn't know. Because <laughs> people aren't, you know, I bet if I had you fill out both forms, <laughs> you know, who knows? I could give you a grade on it. <laughs> But then you'd be divulging, you know, all your income to me. Okay, you know? so, so uh, I haven't found anyone in in say twenty years that filled them out correctly, both of them. Interesting. And that's sad. That's sad. So the CSS profile form, uh, I think, as you mentioned earlier, is only used by uh, a limited number of schools. But you know, like I think a lot of the fancy ones uh, use it. What are the key differences between that and the FAFSA? Yeah. Um, the key differences is – well, we, we forgot about one um, interesting attribute about the FAFSA. If you're divorced, they only look at the income and assets of the custodial parent, and the custodial parent is where the child lives one more night than the other family. And, you know, to me, you can – they don't have a little car, you know, the, the Department of Ed driving around looking to see where your child sleeps every night, right? And it's two years later anyway, so, you know, you can you can kind of adjust that. We want the kid, the child to live with the lower income family. That would help. Now, for the profile, many of the schools, 90% of them, look at the income and assets of both parents, even if they're divorced, the custodial and the non-custodial. So, so in two parents' income is always higher than one. So if you are divorced, you might just look at the FAFSA schools. But I can, you know, it's not as easy as just saying only look at FAFSA schools because FAFSA schools don't give as much money as a profile school. That's why they ask all the questions. They want to make sure you're a truly needy family. But the profile about I don't know. Say there's 250 of them. 80% of them look at the equity in your home as an asset. And Primary on my residence. Yeah, mean, on mean. my website, it tells you how certain schools look at the equity in your home. And it's alphabetical. So American looks at 100% of the equity in your home. So if you, because my son went to American and we had 700,000 of, of, equity in our home because we had paid off the mortgage. So they add that as an asset to your cash. And 5% of that number is 35. So 35 of our EFC came from the, the home. And I called the lady and asked her, but you're, how did sorry, you? You're, you're saying yeah. for the CSS profile, right? Yeah, not, for not, the CSS. For the, not for the FAFSA. Right, but American uses the CSS. You'll Wait. find out that your child will have at least one school that uses the profile. And is so it, you have to it, fill it out. Uh, so if you're targeting a CSS profile school, are they only looking at that the data from that form and they're not looking at the FAFSA form? They're guess, looking at both because FAFSA has a different formula for aid, but they want to give away, remember, somebody else's money first. So if they can package you with a Pell Grant, with a state grant, with you know a loan, and then they use their own money. And even federal work study is federal, so that's government money. So I you see. get a job at campus. So then the re re the remainder comes from their own endowment funds that they've spent years begging for. I see. So the CSS profile has its own notion of EFC or expected family contribution, but they're going to still try to um, 
they're going to still try to award government money money first before they tap their own yep. funds. Yeah, I based think. on the on the federal formula, and then they augment it with if they want to with their own money. And the EFC for the CSS profile is generally going to be higher because it sounds like it's going to include at least your primary residence, home equity, and, and some right. other things. And that EFC calculator on College Board has it's, it's it says FM on the column and IM FM is federal method IM is institutional and institutional means the CSS profile, but you put in what your equity is. So say it is seven hundred thousand, right? I don't want you to put in seven hundred because most of the schools limit. They put a cap on what they'll look at on your home. So if you're only making fifty thousand, they might put. 50 grand as the cap for your home equity, even if it was 400,000. How do they know that? I mean, you're not going to reappraise the home. So do they just do it based on book value, like when you purchased versus, you know, the remaining mortgage balance? They look for reasonableness. Because if you're in California, say your house is worth 200,000, they'll go, wait a second, what is your zip code? And they'll look, they can look it up on Zillow. Um, Only if they're questioning it. But their offices are so busy that very seldomly you just, have to. Uh, I look at it. What could I sell the house for in 30 days in a distress sale? So that might take 10 or 15, and after tax, so that might take 15% off of what a Zillow would say. They say don't use your property tax, but I would, because that's at least a firm number, and sure. most people look at their property tax. Sure. Yeah, it just seems like a good rule of thumb. And Zillow is trying to get you to be proud of your house. Wow, it went up this. But for financial aid, you want it to be low, not high, right? Right. Okay, so um, what other uh, assets does the CSS profile, or income for that matter, does the CSS profile include that do not get included on the FAFSA form? Well, when you file the FAFSA, you get the EFC on the screen when you submit Profile you don't because you're applying to all different schools that have different formulas. So they just take the information and then they calculate their own EFC because some don't use home equity, some do use equity. So even they ask all the questions so you don't know what they're using. So some – they all look at your rental properties or a second home because it asks when did you buy it, what did you buy it for, what was the purchase price, what's your mortgage on it, what's the current market value. So they – they have data that they can manipulate whatever they want on that. So they just I don't see. tell you. And But so on it, the FAFSA form, you're not even going to put in your retirement accounts, your HSA, your small business equity, but are you going to include all that all that on the CSS profile? You're supposed form? to put if you have a second home or rental properties, you need to put them in. Now, one big question that always comes up, if I have three rental properties, is that a business? And if it's a business, could I exempt it from you know, putting it down as an asset on the FAFSA form. Well, a lot of colleges right. don't want you to do that because they give out less money, right? Right. Because so, three rental properties probably has a lot of value to them. But just to clarify, so uh, I understood you, that you said a moment ago on FAFSA, anyway, you're going to have to put rental properties. So on both forms, you're putting on rental properties. But my Well, question- if you only have one, they look at it as an investment. But if you had, say you had 15 of them, that's really a business because you're spending all your time managing them, fixing them up, whatever. I see. But you would want a separate tax return for that. You'd want a sub S or a, you know partnership return or something. I see. You don't want it to be Schedule E of your own tax return because that looks like an investment. I see. But then you have to plan that years in advance, like at least two years in advance because they'll be looking at a tax return sure. two years earlier. So uh, That's a tough one. So for – I guess uh, just to um, – uh, clarify the rental property situation. If it's an investment, then you have to put it on the FAFSA and the CSS profile. If it is a business, you don't put it on the FAFSA, but you have to put it on the CSS profile. Is right. That correct? Yep. Got it. Uh, what else? What about retirement accounts? Um, does that also go on the CSS profile? Let me just give you a, a reason why they don't, they, all retirement accounts are exempt because mm-hmm. people used to have pensions. And so, but when you would get maybe 4000 a month till you die, but when you die, it stops. So they couldn't figure out a, a equitable way of putting a dollar value to your pension. So for that reason, they exclude pensions because some people – I mean uh, retirement accounts. Some people have $2 million in their retirement account, and I'm sure the colleges – because you put it on the profile, so it looks like they – 
attach, uh, attack it, but they're just looking supposedly for the financial strength of the family by saying, wow, you have $2 million. If they So if maybe if they have to give out their last dollar, they would give it to a family that wiped out their retirement starting a business or a business that failed. But I'm sure they're salivating when they see somebody with $2 million and know that their policy is to exempt it and that we have to give them aid. Interesting. So, And I, I can tell if – the college atta- attached or used it as an asset because I already know because I figure out their EFC even for profile forms and if the aid package isn't close to what I think it is, something happened and then we can question them on did you use the retirement accounts and I had a college the next day give them a revised oh, wow. uh, aid board so we caught them. So let me just <laughs> get this straight. So. They're not supposed to use – CSS profile uh, schools are not supposed to use retirement accounts, but right. you still put it on the form, and sometimes they might actually tip – They're not in, supposed to. The rule is they're not supposed to. It's it's an agreement they all made that they don't look – they don't attach because it wouldn't be fair for the person, the family that has a pension because they – it's not their money yet. The, yeah. But then you know, if, the government uh, still owns it. if they're not supposed to look at it, why even require you to list it? They look at it as the financial strength of the family. Which sounds to me That's like they're they taking say. it into I know, account. I know. I know. <laughs> call one of them and ask them. No, just call them blindly. I have an email address that doesn't have my name in it because <laughs> my email address is paula at paulabishop.com. Sure. And I think after a while they know who I am. So I have my other one that's my disguised one. And, um, and they'll tell me, you know, and then I'll have it in an email back on paper of, that they don't use it. So, uh, and so it sounds like you're you're doing it, your own calculation and making sure that the final EFC basically um, approximately matches. And if it's very far off, then you're inquiring to say, "Hey, did you look at retirement accounts and uh, yeah, like or that. your home, or what did?" You, because if they tell me they limit the equity in your home to two times your earnings and you're making a hundred, and so they should use two hundred thousand as the equity, but. Even though your equity might be a million dollars, so they should exempt eight hundred thousand dollars of your equity. But if your aid award comes out really not close to what I think it is, I'll call them or I I'll have the parent call them. They don't like having a hired gun. They call it uh, call them. I see. Why is that? Because they have an unfair advantage that they're hiring somebody to fight for them. It's like a lawyer, right? Yeah. They usually get a better deal from you than if you just represent yourself. Well, as a parent, isn't that the point? I want somebody who can get a better deal. I know, deal. I know, I know, I know. But don't <laughs> brag about it to the college sure. because, you know, why pay me when if you have qu- questions, just call them. Right. Well, they're okay. not that well-versed. I gave a, a class to financial aid people at a conference. There were 100 people in the room on how to read a tax return. I almost I was blown away. I see. They don't know how to read it, but they're responsible for them. Yeah, that's pretty scary. Um, okay, so FAFSA, uh, as I understand, required you to list um, assets as of the date of the file, but mm-hmm. it only looks at prior prior year wages. So I guess that mean if it means if you're filing income, don't just say wages because you know income. people have other stuff. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. I guess if you're going to file in say the fall of uh, 2020, then you're looking at tax year 2018 income and mm-hmm. so uh is that uh, well if you're going to school in 2020 in fall of 2020 you look at 18 oh i see so you're, the you're, seniors you're, now are looking at 18 i see so you're filling out in 19 looking at 18 but going to enroll in 20 yep gotcha is that also true for the css profile form yes thank god I see. because this has only been around for i don't know five or six years because if it wasn't that way, they would be looking at 19s. And when do the kids fill out the FAPS and, or the parents fill out the FAPS and profile in 19? So all FAPSs and profiles were done on estimates. So I would spend all my time estimating people's tax return based on the previous year. And then colleges are basing their financial aid awards on estimates. And then when they filed their tax return, they had to update the awards and we had to update the FAFSA. So every family had to do it twice. So that was some brilliant person said, why don't we just go back two years? So we might have more appeals because what if now you're divorced or what if now you're, 
disabled or unemployed or something like that. So they have a lot more appeals to aid awards saying my current income is this now, please use 19 instead of 18 or something like that. But that, but at least they have a filed tax return and, you know, it's much easier for everyone involved. Okay. Are there any other key differences that folks should be aware of between FAFSA and the CSS form? Well, I, I would say don't be afraid of the profile form because those schools have more money. They, in general, fill all of your need. And I'll just give a small example of what your need is. If the school costs 60 and they think you can afford 20, you have 40,000 of need. Now, a profile school will give you the whole 40. Might be some loans or work study or whatever, but they'll fill the whole 40. A lower end FAPSA school might only give you 85% of that need or 60%, depending on how much they want you. So even for the same EFC, a two point, well, a 3.0 kid would get a different award than a 3.8 because they want to up their stats in the U.S. News and World Report or whatever they want to do. Right. Okay. So, but a- any differences between the forms to be aware of? Well, one is only six pages and one is about 15 pages. Right. So, so you don't just start on Sunday night saying, like, your tax return, I'm going to do it Sunday night, right? Sure. And, you know, you should start Saturday morning. Because sure. a lot of it is they want to know every person in the household, what's their age, what's their name, what what schools do they go to. You know, if they go to college, how much was their scholarship? How much do you pay out of pocket? And on the FAFSA, you just put, I have two in college or one. I they see. don't want any backup, so it's much easier. I see. Is the CSS form asking this question even for other family members who have already graduated, maybe even a long time ago? No. No, they say how many are in the household. So if there's four in the household, they want to know how old that – and only one student going to college, they want to know how old is the other child. I see. So they're only asking about presently attending uh, college Yeah, uh, or presently in the household. Because if you have a junior and the senior, they'll know that next year you'll have another child in college. And part of the formula has an allowance from your assets for students going to – savings for future students. Uh, what does that mean? Say more. Um, FAFSA pretty much what your assets are, they might have a protected asset of, um, allowance of $6,000. Forget it. I mean, that's nothing, right? You know, they don't want to take your last dollar, so they exempt 6000 Profile form exempts maybe $80,000 because th- the parents have to survive, right? So they have an asset allowance for the parents, and then they have an educational allowance for the other three years for college for that student and any other siblings that you might have because they'll assume that they're going to go to college too. So even though they look at your equity in the home, most of them, it might be equal what the contribution from assets are because there's a lot more uh, exempt assets on the profile side. Interesting. So am I understanding correctly that if, let's let's say there's four uh, kids in my you know, household, and I'm going to be the first to go to college. Does that, it, on the CSS form, am I getting it's kind of a shadow credit? For- yeah, you're getting about maybe $130,000 subtracted from your assets to pay in- for those four kids. That's a lot of money. Even though That's why they people may- don't have four kids anymore. <laughs> sure, but even though they may still be in junior high, high school. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. I see. Um, and FAFSA doesn't have any allowance for that. FAFSA has old formulas that haven't been revised since the 60s. Other than that, asset protection allowance is just going down and down and down. I think in two years, they won't even have one because 6000 is really nothing for a family of four. Right. Okay, so then uh, in the same example, if I'm in a, you know, uh, a household with four college-bound kids, I'm the last one to go to college. Let's say two of them are already graduated, so they're no longer on the payroll, so to speak, mm-hmm. and one of them is a senior. I'm about to be a freshman. How does the CSS profile evaluating that situation well, you put down that you have one in college next year, right? Because if you have a senior, they'll, they'll be out, right? And the freshman is just coming in. So unfortunately, you should only, you only have one. Yeah, you have to do proper prior planning. You should have quadruplets. or So they're all in college at one time. So then your EFC is divided by four. I so see. if you had two in college, it's divided by two. And one in college, you know, 
Never have your kids like five years apart. <laughs> I see. So in, in that example, if two are already out, already graduated, one is a they don't se- care. senior. Yeah. So then you're they're they're just looking at you as if the the last one to attend college as if you're almost like as if you're a single child. Is that correct? Yep. 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 Your asset protection allowance is much lower at that point. Might only be, I don't know, thirty thousand or something instead of one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Got it. So that that's pretty important distinction. Are there any other key differences between CSS and FAFSA that folks should be aware of? Um, well, they ask for the the retirement accounts, and you really don't know what to do. They want the value of your business. So even if you have a small, m- many people have a service business like you. Like, what would you say your assets are? Uh, it's all. I mean, it's mostly intellectual capital. So right. Yeah. So it'd be zero. And so I would put. Then they ask, what if your what kind of tax return do you report your business on, whether it's a Schedule C or Subchapter S or a corporation? What are your revenues? What are your expenses? And then they ask, uh, and what are your assets? And they give you a line to describe your your business. So I say that it's a service service business, minimal assets. Because even a real estate agent, they want you to put that because usually there's Schedule C in a tax return and they don't really have any assets. You know, you got a computer and it's not worth much. So Got it. So basically you're including all financial information uh, on the CSS. There's nothing that's really exempted except for retirement accounts. Yeah. And it asks you specifically. So if they have a question, they can say, oh, what about this business? You know, what kind of business is it? Why why do you have no assets or something? They can call you on that. Where on the FAFSA, you know, you wouldn't put it, right, because it's under 100 But even your investments, you could put $100,000. They don't know that you have – that you forgot to put your your rentals because they didn't ask for rentals. The, I don't know if you've noticed this because you deal with people that know something about finance, right? Mm-hmm. The average parent – is clueless about their own money. They really are. That's I meet sad, people but with it, three and four hundred thousand dollars of income, and they might have twenty grand to their name. Yeah. So they can easily forget to put in their rentals. Oh, another thing that they forget is their five twenty nine college savings. That is an asset because because it's for college. A normal person would expect that they want to know about how much do you have saved for college, right? But, oh, that's in, it's growing tax-free. Well, big deal. It's still an asset. How is that not fraud? Maybe you forgot, but that that looks like fraud. People don't don't know anything about their money. Because say you have three accounts for your three children for 529. I I, I get that. I get that. But I Uh guess my question is... um, it's, it seems very convenient for me as a parent to quote unquote forget and then claim that I didn't know. So how is that not fraud? Because that just looks like fraud. I know it is. And you just hope that they don't – they will find out maybe when you withdraw money from your 529 to pay for college and they'll say, well, where did this come from? But a place like UT Austin or Berkeley, they don't, they don't have people looking at checks that come in. They have no clue, right? It goes into some kind of lockbox or something. Yeah. How does this work? Um, they just get away with with um, they get away with it. Is that That's also why, tr- is that also well, true for the CSS profile, or is there more yeah. stringent enforcement for that? Well, this usually the financial aid people at a profile college are have been there longer and are smarter. You can't put like I've had to argue with Harvard several times. They, you know, they've been there for 20, 30 years. They've seen it all, trusts and things. Sometimes people have a trust where you don't get the money till you're 25, and the average parent wouldn't put it on there saying that I won't get it till 25. I can't use it now. Well, the school wants you to put it down because what if it's $5 million? That way, hey, take out loans now and pay it off with your $5 million. So you have to put it down, but they're not born knowing that. I see. So generally, is it safe to say there's going to be more rigorous enforcement for CSS schools? Oh, yes, I think so. Yeah. But at FAFSA schools, it sounds like it's sort of as long as it's not completely ridiculous, it's it's sounds like it's almost like more like the honor system. Well, it's 
that's why they question if you have 6000 in interest and dividends and you say you have no assets, but the 529s don't generate interest and dividends while you're in school. Right. So they wouldn't notice that. And if you have three kids, they want your 529 for all three kids added together because you can change the beneficiary at any time because you still own the 529. For sure. So it sounds like as long as it's internally consistent, then uh, you're, it's unlikely that FAFSA folks are going to come after you. I mean, I mean, it would be right. fraud. So if you're caught, you go to jail. But um, uh, it sounds like there's not really There is strict- a verification system, and they pretty much verify a third of everyone. But the things that they verify are not money. It's how many kids in the family they want you to – because on the FAFSA, you just put five people and two in college or one in college. So they want to know what are their names, how old they are, what school they're going to. I see. You know, and if they're going to college. Got it. That's that's the only thing that they verify. And they also want you to upload your tax data into the FAFSA because there's a IRS data retrieval process because they want to see a filed tax return because so many people do their tax return on TurboTax. You can print out anything, right? So now they want it uploaded from the IRS. Okay. Um, so now let's say the student gets their financial aid package back. Is it negotiable? So let's say they get don't, don't a, a, say the word negotiable. They hate that word. Okay. Or well, is there appealable? So in let's say you get an aid package of one x from your top school, but an aid package of two x from your second choice. Can you appeal? And what are the factors that make somebody successful in appealing? Yeah. Some schools say no way. We don't look at any other awards. But if you got into Yale and also Harvard, right? And you rather go to Yale than Harvard, they might match Harvard's award because it's the same. school type of school, right? Highly selective Ivy League. So they might, because I've had that. And then I had one for Penn. I think they just messed up on the award. So the next day we emailed them Williams and Pomona, which are highly selective schools. And the girl got $16,000 the next day. But if you're comparing, say, a Loyola Marymount with a American university, they're not going to match it at all because Loyola gives more merit awards, they won't match a merit award school with something that's a need based school at all. So most of them say we don't we don't um, consider other offers, but you could try. I I have the family run it by me first to see if they have something to stand on. I see. So um, other than that, though, uh, it would only be if they made a mistake, such as like they took into account your retirement accounts or something like that. Well, it depends on if they want the student. You know, say they're a high, high end student and one school gave them 25 as a merit and one school gave them 30 and they really want that student. And I, you know, I'm not one of the insiders to know why they want that student, but they might add another five because they figure throw another five at them. We have that award winning, you know, writer or something like that, or they saved the world already, you know, with, you know, cured cancer or something like that. You know, I see. They, they pay for top, top students. Interesting. But Harvard wouldn't because. It's need based only. So if you're rich or if you're over two sixty, you know, and two sixty doesn't go that far in California, right? I see. So is that low income in Silicon Valley? I don't know. I don't think that's low income, but uh it's uh But they they don't happily write a check for seventy five, eighty thousand dollars, do they, a year? Uh who? A a parent in Silicon Valley, their child wants to go to say Yale, do they happily write a check for eighty thousand bucks? I mean it's it's Family by family, but that's certainly Mm -hmm. uh, an expensive uh, cost to bear for, I would say, the average, even the average California family. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Definitely the average California family for sure. But it's a a win if you're low income because you might get a full ride to go to Yale. So it sounds like, if I'm hearing correctly, it sounds like there's no harm in asking, so you might as well ask. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they've already admitted you, right? They've already given you an award, so they can't take it back. Sure. But if it's just, oh, my kid is so wonderful, I have the parent write it because I don't know their child. I haven't lived with them for 18 years to know how really wonderful they are. Okay, so um, what strategies can parents implement? So now now that we know kind of what's required on FAFSA versus CSS, uh, what are some strategies that parents can implement in the years before their child is college-bound to minimize their EFC and maximize their uh, financial aid? Well... The problem is usually their their income from work, 
right? If you're like here, we have Amazon, Microsoft, all that, and you have all those companies where you are. And if each of them are earning 150, 200, I don't want them to quit their job because they're out of the workforce just to get some money. You know, you make more money, you get, you're better off working than not working to get some aid. It's not a good trade off because you already also don't know where you're going to, the child's going to school. So, and sometimes when you're out of the workforce, it takes a lot to get back in, especially if you're a contractor or something like that. So, you know, pretty much your options are are gone for moving around your money or something like that. You know, so you could say you had some cash, you could pay down your mortgage because not like even Harvard, Stanford, they don't look at home equity. University of Chicago doesn't. So there are some that don't look at home equity so you could pay off your mortgage. But that only gets you so far because your income could knock you out of the game. So there really aren't a zillion strategies to to fool around with your money. Just don't take – like say you need extra money for a sickness or something. Don't take it out of your retirement because it's income on your tax return. And then you have to beg the school to – take that out when calculating aid and you have to send that request to all the schools you're applying to. So you'd rather not have it on the base year that you're doing that. Uh, and just, you, to, just to be clear, uh, nobody's accounting for, uh, uh, sorry, most schools are not accounting for primary residence home equity. Is that right? Right. Well, right. yeah, only 250 might not. They, they might look at your primary residence. Oh. 77% of the nation kids go to public school. Right. So the majority don't look at it. Only really about one, less than 1% go to the highly selective schools and about 20% go to the mid-range private schools. If, uh, if uh, parents were already thinking about retiring, maybe they were planning to retire sometime in the, the child's junior year of college, would you suggest that they consider perhaps retiring early so that their income goes down? Well... Um, you know, I would write an appeal letter. I do a lot of appeals. I don't do a lot of appeals for more money unless I see a problem in the formula or I think the school's messed up. Um, usually the appeal is because of something like that because tomorrow's client, the guy's 69 and he's retired, but he hasn't taken Social Security yet and he's trying to get his last kid who's going to be a freshman next year out of the way, you know, um, and we could appeal something like that. You know, to say use our 2019 and 20 income when I'm retired versus now. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when people retire, they make more money than when they were working, right? How, Depending how on the, on their pensions sometimes, and they take out Social Security, and then they have minimum. He's well, he got lucky. The minimum distribution for, on your 401k is are now raised to 72 years old that, rather than 70. And right. see when you add that in, it, it could be more money than when you were working. Okay, so it sounds like there may not be a ton of strategies, certainly as you are uh, nearing the college enrollment date. But yeah, except well, let's you say know, let's say you're ten years out. Your child yeah. is eight, so oh, they have ten happened. years before they go to college. Are there things that very proactive parents can be thinking about to sort of amortize their way to a favorable position? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have rentals, I would put them in a separate tax return so that you could regard it as a business. But in general, those those kinds of parents want the kid, the child, to go to a a profile school. Which, so, in which case, you would be reporting that anyway. Yeah, because I do meet with young parents sometimes, and we just more or less agree that they don't qualify for aid because the bar for need based aid is so low, to, in my opinion, that give it up, right? Just look for schools that can that want your child and want to give you twenty or thirty thousand dollars for a merit award, and only sixty or seven, sixty say only give need based aid. There's three thousand colleges you could consider, or the public schools. A lot of public schools are you know like public Ivies or so, and there's reasonable ways of doing it. No one's forcing you to go to these high end expensive schools because it doesn't mean you'll be it's there's no guarantee that you'll be overly successful. And I show them the book Colleges That Change Lives, Forty Colleges That Change Lives. They're small liberal arts colleges that really do have an impact on the on the student. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like maybe there's you could move rental properties over to a, a separate tax return, but CSS schools probably are not going to you know it's not going to help you they, anyway. They do discount there... the first 
$500,000 of a business by half so that it would cut the equity in your rentals by half. So that's that's a good strategy if your income is low enough to still be a need-based candidate. I see. Okay. Are there any other things that uh, parents can do, like maybe max out their retirement accounts? Um, that's, always, that's always a wise choice anyway, right? Or put it in a Roth or so or – put it in a non-deductible IRA and then convert it to a Roth. To, right. To, you know, because even when they retire, they want some money from taxable 401ks and then it's nice to have some non-taxable money from the Roth. So Roths are, are good options. Any other, any other uh, strategies? Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, you know, since the profile asks 18 pages of your financial data, there's not much you can change. And really, it's your wages that knock you out. Now, if you have small kids, well, if you have small kids, you don't, probably don't have a senior going to college. Mm-hmm. How should folks be thinking about, uh, as is common, for grandparents to set up uh, 529s? That's an interesting thing because um, – a lot of grandparents want to help, right? I would rather have them contribute money to the parents 529, even though now they have to put it on their FAFSA form and their profile form, but then the the, the parents know how much it's in there. I, I'm always in a meeting and they say, oh, the grandparents are saving money for our children. How much, right? We don't know. Did you ask them? Well, they don't want to discuss it. You don't know if it's five thousand or fifty grand or a hundred grand, right? And so this way, the parents can see how woefully low it is, and then put more money in it. And then the grandparents every year can, can that could be part of the Christmas present: give some to the five twenty nine, and then give some toy that you know doesn't cost that much, so that the kid's still happy because they don't know what a five twenty nine is. But I know it doesn't get included in the assets of the parents if the grandparents own it. But um, at least it's visible to the parents, so they save more. But later on, when the parents are like 80 or 90 and you need money for school, you got to call them, they got to withdraw it. They don't want to have to deal with any of that. So it makes it easier for the grandparents that they don't have to deal with it, but they're still helping out. And later on, when if a grandparent withdraws money, you're supposed to record it on your FAFSA as untaxed income on the child's level. Mm-hmm. The child's income gets dinged at 50%. So you possibly could lose 50% of whatever your child, the grandparents give that year. So you, the strategy is to wait until you filled out your last FAFSA form to record that and then the grandparents can give as much as they want i see so a grant just to be clear a grandparent funded 529 does not get included in assets for uh, i think both fafsa and the css right right? but then when they actually distribute money out to actually fund the kids uh, education expenses that's going to get hit at 50 percent of that uh, untaxed income amount whereas if the parent just held the 529 it would only it would be counted as an asset Right, it's just their at, savings. Dinged yeah, at, no. dinged at mm-hmm. 5%. Right. I see. But if you use it, then you don't have it anymore, so your 5% goes down by how much you used. Sure. I see. So I'm and not a big fan of having – but if it's a wealthy family and they want to – they can gift up to five years' worth. So they can, Well, they can give $75,000 out of their estate, so maybe that's an estate planning tool. Right. Many families just pay – Pay for college, and then for if if you do have a grandparent funded five twenty nine, I guess after the once the kid is a junior, they could start distributing that income because that that will never hit it. Assuming the kid graduates in four years, that should not mm-hmm. hit any more forms because the forms are taking into account prior prior year income, and by the time that untaxed income gets recognized, the kid will have already graduated. So right. um, there's no penalty for that. And I guess now also with the uh, you alluded to the Secure Act before, where the RMDs for retirement accounts or four hundred one ks anyway are increasing to seventy two. There is like a new rule, um, uh, I think, where now five twenty nines can also be used for up to ten thousand dollars in uh, student loan debt, which is really nice. That just happened about I think December twentieth or something. Right. But most kids have more than ten, but it it helps. Yeah, it helps every bit. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Um, where can people find out more about you know you and your work and services? 
my website is just paulabishop.com. And even at Thanksgiving dinner last night, someone said, let me see if I can find you on the web. And so they said financial aid, CPA, help or whatever, and they found me. Cool. So, you know, it could be found, but my website is easy to find because it's just paulabishop.com. All right. Well, we'll definitely link to that in the show notes and hopefully folks can find you there. Paula, and I thanks work so- with people all over the country, so it doesn't matter that I'm in Seattle. Okay, perfect. Mm-hmm. Paula, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with okay. us. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you soon. I wish it was simpler, but it's not. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Bye-bye. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.